Well, I'm delighted that the Inter-American Commission, as one of the leading regional organizations in human rights, is looking at the issue of protests and demonstrations. Uh, and from a perspective of my mandate with the United Nations um, on extrajudicial executions, this is something that I certainly welcome, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to make a brief intervention. Um, I do think the issue of protest and of demonstrations is an important issue. It's one of the issues of our time. Um, some people say uh, this became possible at the beginning of the last century on a mass level, that people would engage in demonstrations to express their views because violence in the world is generally declining. Be that as it may, I do think the other aspect is the important one, and that is that uh, the, the increased uh, use of um, of demonstrations and of, of protest is one of the factors that allow us a world in which instead of having violent conflict where it's possible uh, in many cases to have a peaceful resolution of, of disputes and as such it can contribute towards a more peaceful world and it's also uh, something that contributes towards the opportunity for people to really uh, assert their rights um, and to have a more rights friendly uh, world uh, as well. Um, I think uh, peaceful demonstrations has played an immense role in the world in terms of ending colonization. My own country, South Africa, Gandhi, um, used this vehicle in order to end or at least to address racial discrimination against uh, the Indian population. It was used by him in India as well. Uh, but it has been used in the United States on a large scale to end de facto racial discrimination. It's been used to end colonialism, as I've mentioned. It's been used to change uh, the era of, of the Cold War, uh, bring about the fall of the, of the Berlin Wall. It has played an immense role in my country in ending apartheid. And as we know, in more recent times, it has played a role in terms of putting issues on the agenda, such as uh, gender equality, environmental issues, uh, political freedoms and many others as well. This is not to say that in all cases peaceful protest is something that should be welcomed, but a world in which peaceful protest is possible uh, I think is infinitely better than a world in which it is not possible. Um, in which it's well managed I think is a, is a world that's much better off than a world in which peaceful protest is not well managed. And I think that is the common uh, uh, um, endeavor that we have and I think it's very important that regional systems uh, in particular, a leading system such as the Inter-American system takes a role uh, in addressing this issue and in determining what the international standards uh, should be. And this is certainly something that we from the UN um, that we are also welcoming. Um, as you may know, in 2011, I submitted a report to the Human Rights Council on the issue of, of demonstrations and the use of force. Uh, but more significantly, the Human Rights Council adopted a resolution um, requesting the Special Rapporteur on Assembly and Association, Maina Kiai, and also myself, Rapporteur on Extrajudicial Executions, to report to them in March 2016 uh, with a set of best practices uh, and an overview of ways in which um, this, this very modern phenomenon uh, should be dealt with within the human rights framework. And we're working on that, uh, on that report now. It will involve uh, also regional consultations. There will be one in Latin America. The details will be known quite soon. Uh, there will be at least one in another part of the world, maybe two. Uh, there will be a consultation in Geneva as well. Um, and we're in the process of consultation through questionnaires uh, with states and with NGOs and all other stakeholders. Um, and and uh, I want to use this opportunity really to say that we are welcoming, and this, this is on the website of the Office of the High Commission of Human Rights, we welcome responses to the questionnaire that we've drafted and we will welcome a participation in the regional consult consultations as well. So, so what are the main issues? From the perspective of my mandate, I think the use of force is by the police, by law enforcement officials, um, is probably the main one. Um, in many cases, um, the domestic laws dealing with the use of force around the world, in, 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 in uh, Africa, in Latin America, uh, in, in many other parts of the world, in Asia, um, the, 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 law, the domestic laws are out of date. They often come from pre-human rights, from the pre-human rights era. Um, the international standard, I think, is, is fairly simple. Um, in the sense that force may be used only if it's necessary and if it's proportionate. 
Um, so proportionate means that in terms of the damage done, there must be a balance with the interest that is being protected. Uh, and then uh, in terms of necessity, um, that one must use the least violent uh, methods possible. Now, as far as the use of lethal force is concerned, I think what has uh, crystallized on the international uh, level is what I like to refer to as the protect life principle. That this requirement of proportionality is met only if lethal force is used, in other words, if a life is taken, if that is done as a minimum in order to protect another life. So if one has a demonstration and lethal force is used, that may only be done if that is absolutely necessary in order to protect life. That's the minimum requirement. That really means that um, lethal force may not be used in order to protect property. It may not be used uh, to protect uh, people from minor injury. It may not be used, and I think that's the important point, simply to um, restore law and order. There must be a threat to life to which it is in response. Now, on the domestic level, we find laws in many parts of the world, including in Latin America, that do not comply with these standards. They are either very vague, they talk about uh, it must be reasonable, and that seems to open the door to, to a, very, uh, a, prog um, a very permissive approach to the use of force, um, or they do not have the requirements of necessity of proportionality. So I do think, from my perspective, um, the first line of defense is really the domestic system, and so I do think, and this is what I, the point I, I made in my report, is that it's important that states reform their domestic laws to come closer to the uh, standards of international law, in particular the protect life principle of, of international law. Um, so domestic law reform I think is often necessary, uh, and a regional system plays a, a strong role, NGOs as well play a st strong role in encouraging states and assisting states where necessary in order to reform their laws, their regulations, but also, very importantly, their practices. Um, it's one thing to have the laws on the book. It's the, the other question is whether it's actually implemented in practice. And there, I think it's important as well that regional systems hold states to the requirements of international law. Um, as far as the use of force is concerned, I think also an issue that deserves attention is uh, what traditionally um, was called the use of non-lethal weapons. Now, I think uh, um, even in the basic principles, the UN basic principles, this term is used, but I think over time, over the last 20 years or so, we have seen that most weapons, even if they're called non-lethal, that they can, under certain circumstances, actually cause death or serious injury. Um, and a whole host of new um, weapons have been developed, uh, tear gas, tasers, and so forth. Um, and I do think it's important to take note of this new technology and to make sure that when it's being used, and I, I certainly think it's very good that this technology is the, the, what I would call, refer to as less lethal technology, that it's made available uh, to states, uh, but it's very important that law enforcement officials know the limits. Um, for example, if tear gas is used in a confined space or if a taser is used against somebody on top of a wall, that this can have lethal consequences. So, so the um, level of knowledge and the level of expertise about the use of these less lethal weapons, I think is an area that needs to and deserves attention. There's another area that I won't uh, elaborate upon, but that is the increased use of, of um, unmanned systems, of remote controlled in particular systems where helicopters, for example, may be used by police from a long distance to do crowd control. And I do think that there are also issues there that need to be looked at, the depersonalization of the use of force. Uh, it really flies in the face in many cases of the task of the police to be on the spot and to protect those, for example, who may end up underfoot and may, be, uh, may end up in a situation of danger to themselves if the police is a long distance off from where things are happening. It may be different in armed conflict, but in law enforcement, I do think there's in particular um, a, 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 a premium that should be placed on the, on the personalization and, and that force should remain something for which individuals are directly responsible. Um, so the use of force, I think, is, is one aspect that I think deserves attention um, from the right to life, from judicial executions uh, perspective. But I think it's also important to emphasize that the right to life really has two components. 
One is that there are certain norms when force may be used, for example, the protect life principle that I've mentioned. But in the second place, um, an integral part of the right to life is the need for accountability when these norms are transgressed. Um, so that means that if somebody does not comply with proportionality, does not comply with necessity, uh, a law enforcement official, for example, um, that uh, even if there's just a suspicion, there should be a proper investigation, an independent, a prompt investigation. Um, and if this person is found to have violated the international standards, that their steps should be taken. And these steps can range from disciplinary action, it can, it can take the form of, of prosecution. Um, but the important point is that if there is not a proper system of accountability for violations of the right to life norms, that is in itself a violation of the right to life. So the right to life has these two components and the absence of accountability, in other words, uh, impunity for, for, the, for arbitrary uh, uh, use of force and arbitrary killing, um, that is part and parcel of the protection of the right to life. And if that does not occur, there's a violation of the right to life. Uh, there are a number of other aspects that I think are, are uh, important if one looks at demonstrations and peaceful assembly. Um, they do not necessarily fall directly within my mandate. Uh, for example, um, the, the management of demonstrations. Um, does one have a demonstration in a place that is uh, within sight and sound um, of those against whom it is, it is aimed, um, who, those who are addressed? Um, are there too difficult uh, 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 criteria for those who want to engage in protests that they, for example, have to ask for permission and that it's very difficult to get permission? Uh, all of those things, I think, uh, also constitute an uh, area of, of great importance. It's not directly in my mandate, but it is relevant in the sense that if upstream, where the protest is managed, it's not done well, and if protest is made impossible, you're going to end up lower downstream, you're going to end up in a situation where force will be used um, by either or both sides. So one of the important points that I want to emphasize is really within human rights law also the need for prevention and for, pre for precaution. Um, so the right to life requires not only that those, those with their finger on the, on the trigger, that they know what the requirements are when they may shoot. In many cases, that's too late. Uh, one should really go upstream, and that's why I think this component of management facilitation of demonstrations is very important, because if you can manage it well, and if you can de-escalate uh, the, the tension, um, then you will not end up in a situation where force may be used by either or both sides. So I do think that that component is also important when one looks at, at demonstration. So from my side, um, all best wishes. Uh, we are looking forward to your inputs uh, that we would also be able to use in, in our report. But I do think it's important to emphasize that the UN is one of the players on the international uh, stage, uh, but the regional systems are very important as well. And independently, they also create international law. And it's a very important source of dealing with this modern phenomenon, um, the, the one of the use of demonstrations which I think it's important to establish how it should be managed to make sure that it does eventually play its role in terms of ensuring less resort to violence, a possibility for grievances, but also that it's balanced with the interests of the states in terms of securing um, public order, in terms of securing the rights of other citizens and so forth, and that that balance is struck in a reasonable way and the process in which you are engaged, I think, is a very important component of that. So thank you very much.